physical therapy and strength and conditioning world, diaphragmatic breathing tends to be a controversial topic. Depending on who you ask, you'll get different answers as to what's right and what's wrong and what should move and what shouldn't move. But at the end of the day, your execution needs to align with your intent. So the way that you're coaching that breathing, does it truly align with your overall goal? Ultimately, that's what's going to make it wrong or right. However, with that being said, I feel there are some myths that we can debunk when it comes to diaphragmatic breathing. And what I want this video to do is to help you gain a different insight and a different perspective on breathing so that you can utilize it to help restore movement, range of motion, and performance in your patients and clients. All right, so I brought out John Bones Jovi, who will help us demonstrate diaphragmatic breathing. Now, in order to understand diaphragmatic breathing, you need to understand the biomechanics of respiration. And here's the thing, there's a couple key foundational aspects that you really need to understand so that you can then modify or manipulate a movement that is specific to your patient, but in a way that still aligns with your intent, right? At the end of the day, we're trying to make sure that we are in connection with our goal and our execution, right? So with diaphragmatic breathing, you still need to understand some basics of respiration. So a very simplified approach is that I want you to think of three things. We have the pump handle or the sternum, the bucket handle or the lateral border of the ribs, and what's not here is the diaphragm. But the diaphragm has attachments on the xiphoid process, the costal cartilage of the ribs, and the lumbar spine, which is why it has a very big impact and response to movement and patterns and postures, but also it's going to be very easy to understand what it's experiencing based off the rib cage and the lumbar spine position. All right, so let's start with inhalation. During inhalation, the pump handle should open up anterior to posterior, the bucket handle should open up laterally, and the diaphragm should descend down. On exhalation, we get just the opposite. We're gonna get compression of the pump handle. We're gonna get compression of the bucket handle, and the diaphragm is going to come back up, okay? So now that we understand that, there's one other piece. That other piece is air aka oxygen. Now, again, thinking in this simplified approach, I want you to just think about air as being the laziest person you know. Now, most lazy people are going to choose the path of least resistance. So, when it comes to air, that means that it is always moving from concentrations of high to low, right? It is seeking the least amount of resistance. It is not going to go up against resistance. Now, if you wanna see and feel that out for yourself, all you have to do is do a side bend on one side, bring your hand on the opposite side, keep your side bend and take a nice inhale. As you take your inhale, you should feel and see this opposite side expand. Well, then go ahead and do your opposite side bend. With that opposite side bend, put your hand on the opposite chest, stay in your side bend and take your inhale. And you should feel the opposite side expand. Why is this happening? We're creating compression, which is also known as resistance, and the air, the lazy person, is finding the path of least resistance or the lowest concentration and moving over there. So what does this mean with diaphragmatic breathing? Well, this means that when you watch your patient or client breathe, where they are breathing is going to be it, their least resistive, their lowest concentration place. So it's gonna give you a lot of insight as to what's potentially moving, what's not, and is that good for your patient or client? So now we should be a little bit more familiar with respiration biomechanics and the role of oxygen. Let's move back to the intent of the video, which is diaphragmatic breathing. When you hear that term, a lot of times people think that the proper way to execute that is by poofing the belly out and letting the belly go back in. Also, what should happen is minimal to no movement at the pump handle. Now, I wanna challenge that thought for a second, and I want you to think about what's directly behind the rib cage, the lungs. How do the lungs stay healthy and perform optimally? 
by expanding and compressing. They pump. So if you have so much compression here that there's no motion at the pump handle, do you think that the lungs are performing in an optimal manner? Additionally, I want you to think about the correct way and the ideal movement that we're looking for with the diaphragm is that up and down motion. What is going to produce that up and down motion? It's going to be the pressure gradient. It's going to be the influx of air through expansion here, which is going to push the diaphragm down. What's going to allow everything to recoil is when the diaphragm descends in a proper way and then can recoil. Just like with any muscle, we're going to see that. So when you just do this belly breathing, is that really the diaphragm moving in an optimal way? Or is that just your body's response to the resistance it's feeling? What I mean is if there's so much compression here, because we know air is a lazy person, there's nowhere for it to go besides here. In an ideal world, we want to allow the pump handle to move. We want to allow the bucket handle to move so that we can appropriately move and ascend and descend the diaphragm. To me, that's proper diaphragmatic breathing. So we don't necessarily want just movement here. We don't want just movement here. There needs to be a variable motion of inhalation, allowing this to descend, but it needs and only can descend from this expanding, which pushes that down. So when we coach our patients and clients through diaphragmatic breathing, I want you to start to challenge yourself and think about, am I really getting the outcome that I want? Is this effectively working the diaphragm or is this person just breathing because they're met with so much resistance that there's only one option? At the end of the day, when the body only has one option, you normally develop patterns and those patterns normally turn to pain. Why? because they don't have variable motion. And when we don't have variable motion, we tend to have pattern and pain. So what I want you to do instead is I want you to respect and understand the role of air, the role of compression and expansion, because what that's going to do is get you to be able to ascend and descend the diaphragm and not just be stuck in a pattern. So to get the breathing patterns that we want, you need to look at your patient or client and understand how is their posture reflecting their breathing. And if someone is just getting belly breathing, it's probably because they're in a state of extension. That extension, again, is biasing resistance in places and expansion in some places. And air is going to go in the least resistive location. So, what I want you to do is first start people in a supine position with their knees bent and just get them to understand how to stack their pelvis over their thorax, right? So normally you have to do this with a slight posterior pelvic tilt and understand that once you're in that stacked position, you start to change the shape and position of the rib cage and the pelvis. That is going to have a response on where is their resistance versus where is there not. So that's number one, and if, and if that doesn't work, try quadruped. Quadruped's a nice way because you have gravity. It's gonna let this open up through its natural mechanisms of gravity. And in that case, you can work on getting some expansion here and getting a little bit more compression here. Because at the end of the day, you need to make sure that your patient has that variable motion. That variable motion is going to lead to better diaphragmatic breathing because the diaphragm is going to have leverage to ascend and descend because it's not being met with just one particular pattern. So I hope you found that valuable. Let's go through a quick recap so you can understand the main takeaways. I want you to feel more confident when it comes to diaphragmatic breathing. And I want you to start to move away from just the belly breathing aspect, but really understand functional biomechanics and understand how do I get full movement excursion available to the diaphragm. We have to start to understand that is the position and the pattern or posture that we're in creating a very one direction or one way street for our diaphragm to move through. 
we need to improve movement excursion of the diaphragm to be able to ascend and descend. And we need to do that by understanding resistive patterns, right? Is my patient or client too compressed, which is causing them to only move the belly? If that's the case, we need to start changing our pattern and posture. Why? Because the diaphragm, based off its attachments, are going to be directly influenced. So we can do this by learning how to stack. We can go in a hook line position, teach your patient how to appropriately get in more neutral position, which normally means posterior pelvic tilts. Once you're there, if that's still a difficult time for your patient, feel free to go to a quadruped position. Quadruped is going to let that pump handle expand based off the influence of gravity so that you can start expanding there and start moving the diaphragm through its full movement excursion.